Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin's concept for a rigid airship foresaw the need for its assembly ship to align with the wind. So his first hangars were built on the Lake of Constance. When hangars were moved ashore, the method for moving rigid airships in and out of them was dependent on large numbers of handlers and calm conditions. Nature would occasionally overpower even the largest handling crews. When helium gas was later introduced, its scarcity and expense prohibited venting to lose lift. Deaths resulted when handlers were not properly trained. The British were the first to recognize the airship need not be docked after every mission. Developing the three-wire mooring system using anchor blocks. An airship could be moored out for a time to await calm conditions for the large crews to safely pull it into the dock. At airship bases, tricky winds around the hangar doors were a major problem. Rails installed in hangar floors were extended outward to accommodate side trolley cars. These wheeled trolleys clamped to the rails kept the airship in line during transits. Well clear of the hangar, the rigid airship could be brought into the wind and launched safely. The British later engineered a plumb bob-like bow fitting with central cable to fit in a flower pot-like receptacle with its own cable. With these innovations, they developed the airship mooring mast. Safely locked in the cup, the airship could then weather vane in ever-changing winds and even make pitching movements. The Americans copied the idea of building permanent towering structures plumbed with gasoline, water ballast, lifting gas, and electrical lines. The airship's mooring cable was coupled to the mass cable and the winch would reel it in until a locking mechanism secured the mooring fitting. Outlying bases around the American perimeter were equipped with less elaborate expeditionary masts that were also plumbed for the airship's needs. Access to the airship involved winching to the top of the mast and stepping from the platform to the bow door. USS Potoka was the ultimate mobile support base in protected harbors. It serviced the airship USS Los Angeles for nearly a month away from Lakehurst. The Germans also developed masts to safely anchor the Graf Zeppelin during stops in Germany, Spain, and South America. The British built massive elevator-equipped tower masts and were well on the way placing them near major cities throughout the empire. The Montreal mooring mast supported the R-100 during its time in Canada. A mast was even built into the new Empire State Building, though it never moored a dirigible. The airships had to be manned and actually flown at all tower masts. Servicing the airship proved to be difficult. Lakehurst engineers introduced the much lower stub mast. 
Its lower height gave much better access for airship servicing. The stub or stick mast could be quickly erected in almost any open field, at any strategic location. The Graf Zeppelin first used an American stub mast after crossing the Pacific to moor in Los Angeles. The next Lakehurst development used a tamped dirt track and an extra wheel on the number one engine car to allow the ship to safely weather vane on the circle, even during gusty winds. To further reduce the manpower costs of maneuvering rigids on the ground, Lakehurst pioneered the mobile mooring mast. Following the first towed unit, Lakehurst later developed a self-propelled mast, which eliminated towing vehicles and provided some of the airship's needs outside the hangar. The Americans used their system of mast and mooring circle when Graf Zeppelin left from and then returned to Lakehurst during its trip around the world in 1929. The side trolleys and experienced handlers prevented damage to the airship when it was docked. Then a circular rail track was built atop Lakehurst's old dirt track. The USS Los Angeles could pivot in the wind with a stern car riding the rails as clamps prevented kiting. Larger, heavier versions of this proven system were constructed to accommodate the ZRS ships coming into service. Lakehurst engineers also built a taller, more sophisticated mast with a very wide footprint. Its steering could be used in line or with crab drive. To allow the airship to operate from any wind direction without conflict, a second rail circle was built further out from Lakehurst Hangar 1. The airship bases in Washington and the one near Pearl Harbor were overhauled with a new lowered mast, as well as riding out circles. Their winches and cables were updated to handle the larger airship expected to scout for the fleet in the Pacific. New Expeditionary, or Class B, mooring stations were also built in South Carolina, Florida, Cuba, and outside San Diego. Goodyear Zeppelin built a self-propelled tripod mast. Hangar alignment was assured with very heavy side winch cars clamped over the air dock's rails. Once clear of the air dock, the airship's tail taxi wheel was removed and replaced with the flight bumper bag. Navy Lieutenant Calvin Bolster and Wellman Engineering developed the 89-ton stern beam to positively secure the tail, riding the rails in and out of the hangar. Spreader gear, a system of wheeled pipes connecting mast and beam, carried its heavy load when pulled or pushed by the mast in and out of the hangar. Once over the hauling circle, the beam's second set of wheels, mounted 90 degrees from the first, were lowered as the first set was retracted. A specially modified 132-ton mining locomotive then moved the assembly until the airship was aligned with the wind. The stern was then floated free, the beam was retired, the tail wheel was attached, and the mast towed the airship to the mooring out circle. The airship could weather vane with the fin secured to the riding out car. Then the bumper bag would replace the taxi wheel and the mission could launch. Completing the Class B mooring stations, all of the ocean approaches to America were protected with a base for an airplane carrying rigid airship. The USS Akron was damaged at Lakehurst in two separate handling accidents that proved even the heaviest of systems could not protect against haste and schedule pressure. Before USS Macon arrived, Lakehurst got a massive new Wellman mast. Its normal 75-foot height could be extended to 160 feet if necessary. When Macon arrived in California, a new Wellman mast and self-propelled stern beam was ready. Rails carried the tonnage of the 80-foot square mast and stern beam straight out of the hangar. 
Spreader gear, a system of wheeled pipes connecting mast and beam, carried its heavy load when pulled or pushed by the mast in and out of the hangar. Only one rail circle was necessary in California because Hangar 1 had been built in accordance with the prevailing winds. Once aligned with a circle, the straight wheels were retracted and the circular wheels were lowered to be carried on a circular track. The Macon would then be pulled around the circle to align with the wind. Early operations transferred the tail to the stern riding out car. But in 1934, it became the accepted practice to launch directly from the stern beam. The bow would be unlocked from the cup seconds before the stern was unclamped from the beam. Engines 7 and 8 would push the nose upward, while others pushed the airship against the wind as the mission got underway. In all its ground operations, the USS Macon was never damaged as its experienced handlers used this proven system. The Germans had developed their own lighter weight mobile mooring mast that used the docking rails for support. The Zeppelin men found that adding wheels to their rigid airships made for a great improvement in ground operations. U.S. Navy officers began a liaison aboard the new German airship Hindenburg in 1936. Under schedule pressure undocking for a local flight from Friedrichshaven, the huge tail was damaged but was quickly repaired for flight. The Hindenburg's first docking in South America was hampered by inexperience. The bow line actually broke, so the ship's engines were used to help it into the hangar. Arriving at Lakehurst, Americans learned the new technique of the rigid settling onto its landing wheel, then being winched up to lock into the mast. The Germans allowed the heavy beam to tow the stern against the wind to align with the hangar, but did not trust the spreader gear to protect the flying weight structure. Hindenburg docked in Hangar 1 only twice, most of its servicing during the airship's 10 visits to Lakehurst were spent riding the mooring out circle with a specially built riding out car managing the stern. The Americans took good care of the passenger airships up until the first 1937 arrival. That stormy May night, Lakehurst insisted Hindenburg not touch down, but rather hover at 300 feet. The powerful corona flooded through the stern fabric, igniting it, and the ship was destroyed. The airship's enormous electrical charge was unable to dissipate until the nose ropes absorbed enough rain to become conductive. The Zeppelin men modified their next rigid's fabric to be conductive and non-flammable, and it was carefully bonded to the framework. Lifted by new hydrogen-filled gas cells, the LZ-130 Graf Zeppelin used the proven mast and rail system beginning in 1938. The last rigid flew all-weather missions for the German government safely right up to the beginning of World War II, never once damaged on the ground. Ground handling equipment and techniques were mature, just as governments no longer had the vision to utilize the rigid airship. When you see a guy with his head held high, take a look Techniques developed for the rigids were adapted and improved for pressure airships. By 1960, the largest American Navy blimps were routinely launched, recovered, and docked with only a seven-man handling crew. A new generation can benefit from the many lessons learned by the pioneers of the rigid airships.